Vibrant, vibrant, vibrant music teaching. Proven and practical tips, strategies, and ideas for music teachers. This is episode 31 of the Vibrant Music Teaching Podcast. I'm Nicola Canton, and in this episode, we're talking about music teaching curricula. Welcome, beautiful teachers. So today we're talking about creating a curriculum for your music teaching practice, why you might want to, and what I even mean by the word curriculum, because it's a bit of a vague word perhaps that may be used for different things, but I do think it's the best one for what I want to describe here. So when we think about curriculum for a particular subject, we're normally thinking about it in terms of school. School teachers might have a curriculum that they have to teach in year one, year two, whatever, during a student's schooling. They have standards that they are expected to achieve, and sometimes those are too rigid and we won't get into that conversation. But there is something laid out that says this is what should be learned by this age, by that age, or by that level of schooling, or by that term. We don't have that as music teachers. And we often don't really think in this way either, do we? We don't have governing bodies. There's no one standing over us saying, your students must have learnt the C major scale before they reach their third year of study or before they reach age eight or anything, right? And I'm not saying that there should be. There shouldn't be anyone standing over saying those particular things. But one of the reasons we don't think in this way is that music is considered extracurricular, okay? So parents are not expecting it either, are they? They're not expecting us to have a laid out step-by-step process for how we teach or for what we're teaching and what will be achieved by different levels. And yes, that can be a good thing. It's good to have some flexibility, but it's not good to just not know where you're going. Do you see the difference? There's no reason that this means we should just be winging it. We shouldn't just be flying by the seat of our pants. We can actually plan these things out and still be flexible. So that's what I want to talk about today. Even though we don't have someone standing over us saying, you must teach this, you must teach that, we can stand over ourselves a little bit and put some conscious thought into how we set the curriculum in our studio and what we want to teach our students and when. because. If you don't set this stuff, if you don't decide it consciously, something else is deciding it for you. You can't just not have one. All you have is a bad curriculum or an unintentional one. But maybe you're letting it be set by exams. I know that's true in a lot of countries, and I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Maybe the exam board is setting your curriculum. Maybe method books are. Maybe you run the whole way through a method book series and you follow that. And that's basically your curriculum. That's what's acting as your curriculum. Or maybe it's just pure chance. Maybe you hop from one book to the other, from one thing to another. You teach lead sheets when you feel like it. You teach scales when you feel like it. And there's no real rhyme or reason behind it. Now, as I said, there's nothing wrong with being a bit flexible and with sometimes going with the spur of the moment, going with what you want to teach at a particular time of year or uh, for a particular event, that's fine. Flexibility is fine. I don't want someone standing up and saying, this is how it should be. Let's all decide exactly when we should teach what and stick to it forever and ever. Amen. No. But there's nothing wrong with having a pre-thought out curriculum for your music teaching that you can refer back to to see, am I off track? Am I aligned with the goals I have for my studio? Or am I not? Am I teaching this student what I should be teaching? Or have I left any gaps? I started thinking about this word curriculum because of something that was really a brief throwaway comment at something I attended at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. So that's our main sort of music academy here in Dublin. And they run the most popular exams in Ireland. So we still have ABRSM, we have Trinity, but RIAM, the Royal Asher Academy, would be a little bit more popular. Okay? Anyway, so they run trainings for teachers. And I was at one of these events. I think it might have been one of their conferences that they run every year, which are fantastic. 
Anyway, so I was at one of these talks and there was some question time. And a teacher asked, how do I incorporate pieces in between exams and how do I motivate my students to learn them and parents to get on board with them as well, right? So they were asking for suggestions of in-between exam stuff and what they should be teaching and how they motivate their student to do that. And the examiner, the one of the head examiners was there answering these questions and he said, He explained a little bit and he gave her some suggestions. And then he said, we've said it before and and I'll say it again. The exam syllabus is not a curriculum. And that really stuck with me because he's so right. The exam syllabus is not a curriculum. The exam board itself is saying it's not a curriculum. But that is a big part of what is wrong with the way we treat exams in this country, in the UK and in Australia. And I think to a certain extent in New Zealand as well. We've become so exam focused and we talk about this exam focused or the exam express, Tim Topham calls it, where students are so stuck on the exam express that everything else goes out the window and we forget that we're supposed to be teaching them music. And this really sums it up to me. The exam syllabus is not a curriculum. We can't blame for the exams for that. And I never have. I like for my students to do exams sometimes. But exams are supposed to be an assessment and they set a syllabus so that you know what to cover for that particular assessment so that your student is prepared for it. It's not meant to be a curriculum. They're not saying this is everything you should teach. If they were, you know, the the selection of scales students learn each year would make no sense. Students should be learning all the scales and then they review and make sure the particular scales for a particular grade are up to scratch in the way that the examiner wants to see them. But that's really where um, my scale levels, I'm getting a little bit off track here, but kind of ties into the same thing. I set up these scale levels a few years ago on the blog, and they've been one of the most popular things there. And they're, of course, in in the VMT library, if you want to check them out there, members. The scale levels were me trying to take back control of scales, because I had let it go that, my students pretty much only did the scales that they needed for an exam when they needed them. And yes, I covered them a bit outside of that, but I didn't really have a plan for it. So the scale levels were a way to structure that, to say, no, I want them to learn this full set. For example, level one is all the major scales, similar motion, contrary motion, and the arpeggios, one octave for the whole circle of fifths before, you know, hopefully before they get to grade one, certainly before they get to grade two level. And my students not, might not be taking those exams, but just as a, as a guide. Anyway, so that's where the scale levels come from. And things like that, when you really step back and say, am I just teaching to the exam? What you're asking is, am I treating the exam syllabus as my curriculum? That's what teaching to the exam is. You're teaching that as if it's the be all and end all. That's it. The syllabus is, is your teaching plan, but it's not. It shouldn't be. I don't think any exam board would tell you that it should. It's not supposed to be everything. You have to come up with your curriculum and exams can be a part of that. And the syllabus will help guide you to when you're preparing specifically for that exam. Okay, so exams are an assessment. They're not everything we teach and they're not our curriculum. We get to set our own. And our own curriculum should be based on our goals, what we want for our students, what types of students we have what we want our studio to be and to represent. Is yours the creative studio? Is it the in-depth theory studio? Is it the playing by ear studio? Is it the classical only studio? Is it the studio where all students learn the well-tempered career? It, It doesn't matter what it is. I'm not telling you what it should be. And I will talk you through how you can find answers to these questions in next week's episode. But today. I just want you to think about this idea of curriculum, whether you have one or rather what your curriculum is now, because even if you don't think you have one, as I said, something is setting it. It could be chance, it could be exams, it could be method books, it could be anything, but something is basically deciding your curriculum now. And what is it? What's your curriculum at the moment? A curriculum can be a great framework for moving forward. It doesn't have to be a prescription. So if you're listening to this thinking, no, that's too restrictive. 
I can't set it that way. I like to be spontaneous. I like to follow my students' whims. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. But I think we should all agree that no student should get to late intermediate repertoire and somehow not know what a crescendo is. So, if that's the case, setting a curriculum will mean that you're not leaving that kind of stuff to chance. Yes, chances are they'll encounter a crescendo, but there's this tiny chance if you just do random stuff, they'll get to that level and they won't know what a crescendo is. And yeah, they can look it up, but you see what I mean. We don't want to leave these gaps. We don't want to be that teacher that, as much as they try not to, teachers will complain about when they get a transfer student from them. And I'm not talking about the one-off um, situation where a student just isn't absorbing stuff. I'm talking about there being major gaps and inconsistencies in the way your students are, are encountering these concepts and learning things and developing their skills. So it doesn't have to be prescriptive, but I believe it does have to exist because it does anyway. Next week, we'll talk about how you find your music teaching curriculum. So I hope you'll join me for that. You can find the show notes for today's episode at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 31. And if you're interested in all this curriculum stuff, I've got something really exciting to tell you about. I'm doing something called the Curriculum Kickoff. This is going to be a five-day challenge to improve your curriculum and lesson planning so that you can feel confident with what you're doing. I get a lot of questions from teachers about how they can plan their lessons in a way that makes sense for music teachers that isn't designed around classroom teaching, which is completely different, and that is flexible enough to work for them, but helps them feel on top of things and like they're getting through the maximum they can in the lesson time. So that's what we're going to be doing in this curriculum kickoff. It's going to be really fun. It's going to be a great challenge. The community will come together. It is totally free, so anyone can participate. And we're going to help you set up your music teaching curriculum and lesson plan for success. It's going to be a really great, great experience for you guys. And I'm looking forward to it as well. So you can sign up for that right now if you just go to the blog or this site, Vibrant Music Teaching, vibrantmusicteaching.com or colorfulkeys.com. That's colorful with two U's, by the way. And there you'll see a little widget in the bottom right hand corner. That's the easiest place to sign up and uh, get involved in the challenge when it kicks off. It's kicking off in a few weeks. Last thing before I let you go is I want to let members know that Piano Power Booster 1, your music teaching curriculum, if you want to use it as that, is now available inside the library. This is a 40-week plan that will take you through oral work, rhythm work, theory, and improvisation, technique, all that kind of stuff. Everything but the pieces. For 40 weeks, that's a whole year for most people, or maybe a year and then some for some of you, of including this stuff in your lessons in a way that is structured, thought out, a logical progression, and helps take some of the weight off your shoulders when it comes to lesson planning. So you can get that inside the video library, you can get the full course, or you can get the lesson plans as well in the printable library, whichever suits you better. That's available right now for you. That's it for this week. We'll talk about how you find your music teaching curriculum next week, and I'll see you then. If you're not a member and you like the sound of the Piano Power Booster 1, the 40-week plan that will take you through oral work, rhythm work, technique, and theory for a whole year of teaching, then you have to check out the Vibrant Music Teaching membership. This full course, as well as many others and tons of games and printables and fun stuff, is available inside. You can sign up today at vmt.ninja.